You don't have to read the writing at the bottom. It's a little smaller than the text we'll be using. Okay, good. All right. Well, again, thank you all for coming out. I hope everyone's comfortable. Uh, it's great to see some interest uh, in this topic. Uh, one, of the, one of the themes, I guess, that we'll look at is, is response to suspicions or fears like this. Um, you know, one response is without even figuring out what the issue is, you run out and try to prepare for the problem that you uh, assume is there. And the other is to stop and take a little investigation and see if there really is something to prepare for. And if so, what is it that you should prepare for and how should you prepare for it? So uh, some of you may have seen this ad. Uh, other ones may be more familiar with the full-page printout that was in the newspaper recently. It has the long count calendar toppling over the title. Um, at any rate, you will probably remember that we will be talking about the Mayan calendar, what predictions can be made about its turnover on December 21st, and also look at Bible prophecies including Daniel 2 and 7, Ezekiel 38 and 39, and a bit from Revelation 16. Also those in the Gospels explaining world events in the last days and how these prophecies are becoming manifest in world events we can read about in our news on a day-to-day -day basis. So just to start with a few of the quotes that have aroused some suspicion about this uh, rolling over of the Mayan calendar. So we're approaching the 13th Bactum. And this is what Maude Worcester Mackinson says about it. The completion, the completion of a great period of 13 Bactons would have been of the utmost significance to the Maya. He's a Mayanist and an astronomer. A little stronger statement here. There is a suggestion that Armageddon would overtake the degenerate peoples of the world and all creation on the final day of the 13th Bactum. Thus, our present universe would be annihilated in December of 2012 when the great cycle of the long count reaches completion. And that's from the book called The Maya, written in 1966 by Michael D. Coe. Also, this is from a uh, notes on a new text from La Corona. La Corona is a recent find uh, from Latin America, found on June 30th of this year. David Stewart writes, the scribe has used this important ritual fact to project forward to when the next higher period of the Maya calendar will also reach 13 a sacred Mayan number, which will come on December 21st, 2012, the Mayan date being the 13th back then. And what's probably got most people the, the most weary, Los Angeles Times reports, the U.S. insists the world will not end this month. And then we read the beginning of that article, those of you who take everything that the U.S. government says and does with a large grain of salt, be afraid, be very afraid, because the government has now made it official that the world will not be in this month. So first off, I want to take a look at uh, what the Mayan calendar is. What is this 13th Bactin that's about to roll over, and why would there be any suspicions about it? So to do that, to do that, I first want you to take a look at our calendar, one we're all familiar with. The Gregorian calendar is the calendar we use in most of the world today. And I'm presenting uh, a modified representation of that calendar uh, so that it's kind of parallel with the way the Mayans recorded their time. So you'll notice um, our first unit is the day. 30 days make up a month. 12 months make up a year. And 100 years make up a century. 10 of those centuries make up a millennium. So we don't usually record centuries and millenniums. We just count years. So this is 2012. We don't say it's the second millennium first century, twelfth year, but think in terms of that and it will help you when we, when we look at the Mayan calendar. So the way we might write the date um, is the, the first placeholder, that is the rightmost placeholder, please look at that leftmost column, so the rightmost placeholder would tell you what day it is, the one next over from the right would tell you what month it is, the middle one would tell you what year it is, second from the left would tell you what century we're in, and the leftmost would tell you the millennium we're in. So today's date would look something like this, 2.0.12.12.9. That is, the ninth day of the twelfth month of the twelfth year of the original century of the second millennium. And we had a big day in our calendar on January 1st, 2000. If you had written it the way the Mayans represent time, it would have been 2.0.0.0.0. The original day of the original month, of the original year, of the original century, of the new millennium. 
That is, it's a new millennium. Okay? So this is how that would be represented. Now let's look at the Mayan calendar. Another note that I didn't present here. Um, all of our counts in this calendar begin with the birth of Christ. That is, year zero, day zero, month zero, year zero would be supposedly the day that Christ was born, as, as well as they could adjust when they made the calendar. In the Mayans, it's different. All their counts begin with their date of creation. According to Mayan legend, the date of the creation of the fourth world, which is the one they believed us to live in. And their representation went like this. A day was called a kin. Okay? It was one day. When you got to 20 days, that made up a winal. Okay? And it would be represented this way. So our day one, and then that rolls over to day two, and day three, etc., until you get up to 19, and then instead of putting 20 there, you would roll over to zero, and you would put a one in the canal uh, margin. Or, sorry, uh, in, in the winal margin. When you got to 18 winal, you call that a ton. That's roughly equivalent to our year. So they had uh, 20 days in a month, 18 months in a year. Okay? And that was called a ton. It was represented in the middle margin. When you got to 20 of the tons, whereas we think, typically think of 10 years as a decade, their unit was 20. And when you got to 20 ton, you called it a cut ton. And that was in the almost leftmost margin, second from the left. And then when you had 20 katans, you call it a bakton, and that's about 400 years, as you can see on the right margin there, roughly equivalent, you might say, to our millennium, uh, very roughly equivalent, to our millennium concept. So this is the way the calendar worked. Now, there's something exceptional about their calendar, um, and that is that it started with 13 and then four zeros, and uh, you can see the rough date according to the GMT correlation, uh, archaeological correlation. That would have been in August 11th, 3114. That's when they believe the fourth world was created. Uh, a few other significant dates. The end of the first Bacton would have been November 13th. The end of the 10th Bacton would have been a big one for them. It would have been March 13th, 830. 80. Uh, 12th Bacton happened in 1618. That was the last one to have rolled over. Now we're fixing to roll over to the 13th Bacton on December 21st, 2012. It won't happen again until 2407. And then you can see, even the Bactons weren't the highest unit. You could go higher. And when you got to 19 Bactons, that would roll over to a zero, and you would have the first of the next order, the higher order uh, of the calendar. So why 13? Why is there so much speculation that 13 is a significant Bacton to end? Um, obviously, there's been 12 before. That's the big deal with the 13th one. But one big thing is the Mayan calendar does not begin on 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, as you might suspect. It begins on 13.0000. And that's because they believe the last day of the last world was 12.19.19.17.19. That is, the last day of the last month, of the last year, of the last decade, of the last millennia of that world, to take Gregorian dates. Um, and so they begin our fourth world on the 13th, in the 13th back then. So they leave the last world, the third world, they did on the 13th back then. And so that's where the assumption comes from that perhaps this one will as well. Now it's a big assumption. First off, if you don't believe in my religion, there's no worry, uh, you shouldn't be afraid or worried of the 13th back in India. If you don't believe that there were three worlds before ours, you shouldn't be worried about this one in <clears throat> Now, you may still be worried about Armageddon. Armageddon, though, is not a Mayan concept. Armageddon is a concept from, Bi from the Bible, from the scriptures. Revelation 16 talks about it. This is actually the only place where Armageddon is mentioned in scripture. So we'll look at the context pretty closely here. It says if you back up to verse 14, off the slide here, for they are the spirits of devils working miracles which go forth unto the kings of the earth and the whole world to gather them to battle to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. So it's talking about an influence that's going to influence international communities worldwide 
And it's going to put them in a position that they will be gathered together to a certain battle. Now it's not a random battle. It's the battle of the great day of God Almighty. So it's a God-ordained battle on His day. On His ordained day. Now Revelation was written by John. The opening verses of it says, He is recording what Christ said to him on the Isle of Patmos. So the next verse that we read here is the words of Christ. He says, Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watches and keeps his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. And he gathered them together into a place called, in the Hebrew tongue, Armageddon. So this is where the battle of the great day of God Almighty takes place. And the seventh angel poured out his vial into the air. This is the beginning of Armageddon. And there came a great voice out of the temple of heaven from the throne, saying, It is done. Remember that phrase, it is done. And there were voices and thunders and lightnings. There was a great earthquake such as was not since men were upon the earth. So mighty an earthquake and so great. So we have several things coupled with Armageddon. We have this great battle of, the, of, of God. We also have Christ coming as a thief. Christ coming is surrounded by this battle of Armageddon. We have gathering of Armageddon. And we also have these signs and wonders, great earthquake, greater than any earthquake mankind has seen so far, lightnings, thunderings, and voices, which we'll also find have figurative meaning as well. So this is what Armageddon is. Well, when is Armageddon? Does it happen December 21st? There's actually been several predictions made about Armageddon. It's certainly nothing new. Go back to 2000, James Harmston made a prediction about it. He was wrong. Pat Robertson made one in 2007. He was wrong. Harold Camping made one in 2011. He was wrong, and so we tried again in 2011. He was wrong again. Ronald Lehman did the same thing. September 29, 2011, he predicted the world would end. He was wrong, and yet the whole world listened to him again in May 27th when he said it was going to be the day he was wrong again. One of the less known ones, but more recent, is Jose Luis de Jesus, uh, June 30th, 2012. He predicted the world would end. Again, he was wrong. There's a whole rubbish heap of predictions that were made for the day that Armageddon would take place, the day that Christ returned. They've all been wrong. It's no wonder. Look at what the scriptures say about it. Matthew 25, 13, Watch therefore, for ye know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. You don't know the day, and you don't know the hour. No wonder they were wrong. That's not the only place it talks about it. Mark 13, 32. But of that day and that hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son, but the Father. That ye heed, watch and pray, for ye know not when the time is. So Christ is saying, not even the angels in heaven. He said that not even he himself knew when he would return. And that day and hour was. So the first thing you should think of when someone tells you this is the day Christ will return is we cannot know. Also in Matthew 24, Watch ye therefore, for ye know not what hour your Lord doth come. But know this, that if the good men of the house had known in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken up. Therefore be ye also ready in such an hour as ye think not the Son of Man comes. He's encouraging us here. Be ready. Be always ready because you don't know when it's going to happen. If you don't know when it's going to happen, what are we supposed to be watching for? It says watch and be ready. Uh, what do all these events have to do with the return of Christ? And should we be interested in all of these uh, possible disasters that seem to be looming on the horizon? You know, we've had a lot of natural disasters over the past decade or so, there's been a large increase in that. There's a huge threat of nuclear warfare right now. Iran's coming to the completion of nuclear weapons. Uh, Syria is definitely in a predicament where uh, they could easily be used uh, in that conflict. <clears throat> there, uh, just read an article yesterday. It sounds like they've got chemical weapons on their warheads already. Uh, another big thing that's been talked about quite a bit is the planetary collision, which I don't think we have to worry too much about. There, uh, uh, there's no evidence by astronomy that we're on a crash course with anything in the near future. Uh, weather patterns have certainly changed, though. There's uh, a lot of speculation about uh, extreme weather patterns changing. 
and uh, affecting civilization. We're developing a lot of strains of viruses and bacteria that seem to be uh, super, super uh, infections that can't be combated with the antibiotics we've used for the last 100 years or so. Uh, here's another big one is uh, solar flares. So we're reaching, the sun goes through an 11 year cycle and we're reaching the maximum in that 11 year cycle for solar flares. Now 11 years ago when we were in the same maximum, it was a very weak maximum. And basically you get back to the cycle before that and there wasn't too much modern technology. Um, some of the worst uh, solar flares that, that have been recorded were during the telegraph era. And they did provide strong enough electromagnetic interference with, with the Earth's atmosphere that uh, telegram machines were sparking. The telegraph operators reported throughout the world that telegraph machines were sparking. So you can imagine if you have a solar flare that big in the upcoming uh, solar maximum, it could knock out GPS, it could knock out satellite, it could knock out credit card transactions. Most of the world's advanced weaponry will be uh, obsolete at least until those come back online. So there's a lot of speculation there about what could happen, what things are about to happen. So do they mean anything to us? Should we be watching these things? Or are they just uh, seeds for speculation? Now I want to take you to a passage in 2 Peter chapter 3. If you've got your Bibles with you, you might want to open them up to this chapter. 2 Peter chapter 3. And I think it explains exactly why there's been all of these things going on and yet predictions based on them about when Christ's return will come have fallen flat. God does want us to see these things and he wants us to wake up to the realization that this could be the end. First thing he tells us is that God's time frame is not the same as ours. So if God says something happens soon and we say, well, it should happen tomorrow, we've probably got a time frame out of whack. Because a day is to the Lord as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. So when we think in a seven year time span, or maybe only a seven day time span, we think of soon as in a few days. Whereas God has existed forever, He sees the grand scope of humanity, the 7,000 years that man has been on earth, and when He says soon, it may mean something different than what we think. He goes on to encourage us not to lose faith because of that. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us for it, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So he's saying is when you see these signs come to pass, and it looks like Christ should be coming back now, and then a month goes by, a year goes by, a decade goes by, and he's not here yet, you shouldn't lose faith. You shouldn't think, well, God's not making good on his promise. You should realize God's being patient and long-suffering. He's giving more the chance to repent, to wake up and realize something big really is fixing to happen. He was going to say, but, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Reading Revelation 16, verse 15, Behold, I come as a thief, Blessed is he see that watches and keeps his garments, lest he walk naked and see his shame. So if these events are only there for us to wake up to, to come to repentance from, do we have anything that we can watch to show the nearness of his coming? There are several prophecies in scriptures, and, and we'll have entitled this section straight from the source because we're actually going to do that. We'll go right to several scriptural prophecies and see how they line up with some of the things we're seeing in the world. Um, do these things really mean that a, a doomsday is imminent? Do they really mean that Christ is going to return soon and that Armageddon is, is approaching? Um, these include Daniel chapter 2 and chapter 7. We'll go over Nebuchadnezzar's dream and Daniel's vision of the four beasts. Uh, these are broad spectrum prophecies. They cover a long time frame. This was a BC time, it was about 5, 595 BC or so that the first one happens. And it basically covers everything from 595 BC all the way to forward of our time, Christ's return. So it's a very long time frame that we're looking at there. So there's not a whole lot of detail put into it. But it illustrates an important principle. It shows us how God's prophecies can be interpreted and how those interpretations play out in world history. And the same with Daniel chapter 7, we get a little more detail on basically the same time period. 
And again, we're able to, to get a few more clues as to how we should be interpreting Bible prophecy and uh, how it will play out in history. Then we'll look at Ezekiel 38. Ezekiel 38 is the prophecy against Gog. And it's very detailed because it's speaking of only the time right before Christ returns. And basically, it's the uh, source to go to for what Armageddon is, what happens during Armageddon. Speaking of the events right before Christ returns. Next, I should have Ezekiel 39 on there as well, because 38 and 39 are one vision, uh, although they're disrupted by a chapter, uh, chapter margin there. But uh, we'll go through both of them. Uh, looking at what we can find from that about prophecies of the end times. And then we'll also look at the words straight from Christ, when his disciples ask him, what are the signs of the time of the end and of your coming? Those are found in Matthew 24. The parallel accounts in the Gospels are Luke 21 and Mark 13. They both will tell us the same story. <clears throat> so let's hop into Daniel 2. Again, if you've got your Bibles, you might find it uh, useful to open those up to Daniel 2. If not, I've got most of the words here on the screen that are relevant. So just a little historical context. <clears throat> Nebuchadnezzar was a king of Babylon. Long name. Just remember he was the king of Babylon. But it wasn't any king of Babylon. It was the king of Babylon when it was at its height, at its climax. Uh, Babylon was basically the first world empire. It took over nearly every country in the no, then known world. All of civilized humanity was subject to Babylon. And Nebuchadnezzar was the king thereof. So you hear the phrase king of the world? He was... King of the world. Um, and Daniel was an Israelite. He was a Jew. And the Jews had been conquered by Babylon along with uh, the other countries. And Daniel was quite young when that happened. And he was put in a special training program to become a royal, a royal minister or a servant to the king. And uh, he's quite wise. He's very well educated, uh, not only in the Babylonian wisdom, but also he retained his Hebrew origins and uh, his Jewish learning and instruction. And that's really what, what helps him out. So Nebuchadnezzar has a dream, and uh, he wants to know the interpretation of it. However, he's pretty skeptical of his wise men and astrologers and magicians. So he tests them, he tells them, I want you to tell me not only the interpretation of the dream, but the dream itself. I'm not going to tell you the dream. I want you to tell me the dream and its interpretation. You can tell me the dream, right? Oh no, you're smart enough to tell me the interpretation. Just so no one's blowing smoke. So, none of them can tell him the dream, obviously. They just complain and bellyache and tell him that he shouldn't be asking that of them. Until finally Daniel steps forward. Daniel prayed and God had shown him the dream and its interpretation. That's what makes it very valuable for us. We have the dream here and we have the interpretation. So we read uh, Daniel telling the king what his dream was in Daniel 2, starting at verse 31. So this is in 595 B.C. Nebuchadnezzar had these dreams. And Daniel tells him, You saw, O king, and behold, a great image. The head of this image was of fine gold. Its chest and its arms of silver. Its middle and thighs of bronze its legs of iron, and its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. That was a dream. Next part of the dream, as you looked, a stone was cut out by no human hand, and it struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them in pieces. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold, all together were broken in pieces. And the wind carried them away, that no trace of them could be found. But the stone became a great mountain and filled the old earth. This was the dream. And Daniel shows the interpretation of it. He tells Nebuchadnezzar, you are the head of gold. You, Nebuchadnezzar, are the head of gold. Another kingdom, inferior to you, inferior to Babylon, will arise after you. And yet a third kingdom, third kingdom of bronze, equating to the belly and thighs of brass, which shall rule over all the earth. And there shall be a fourth kingdom, strong as iron. And as you saw the feet and toes, partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, it shall be a divided kingdom. So what we should look for is a succession of world powers, starting with Babylon, who Nebuchadnezzar was the head of. After him, another kingdom would come, not equal to Babylon's glory, but slightly below it, inferior to it, represented by the breast and arms of silver. After that nation, another would come, 
represented by the belly and thighs of brass. And after them, a fourth kingdom. And after that fourth kingdom, we shouldn't expect any more world empires. We should expect a dividing of its power, a divided kingdom. So let's look back through history. What do we find? Well, we've got a timeline here. Uh, it's, it's to scale, so I hope you can still read some of the words on there. Uh, about 4000 BC, very roughly, we have creation. Around 2460 would have been the flood, uh, Noah and his family. 2100 BC, we have the promises to Abraham. They go into Egypt and the Exodus. They come into the Holy Land. Israel's at its height. And then we are in Babylon. The Babylonian Empire is here, this band of gold in the timeline. It's the Babylonian Empire. They destroyed Jerusalem about 586 BC. They were the head of gold. What does history tell us happened after the Babylonian Empire? Well, they were a great and splendid nation. They had incredible armaments and defense. But the Persians, under Cyrus the Great, conquered Babylon in 539 and took over rulership of the then known world. They were the second world empire. They were great, mighty, but they didn't attain to the glory that Babylon had, although they overthrew it. They're the breasted arms of silver. What happened after the Medes and the Persians established their empire? Well, they lasted for a while until about 330 BC when a famous individual came on the scene, Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great was Grecian. He overcame the Persian Empire. It happened around 330 BC. As you can see on our chart here, in the bronze color, the Grecian Empire begins. Now, Greece, Greece uh, was established under Alexander the Great, and then his four generals took over after him because he had no kids. He died around 30 or 33 years of age. And his four generals divided up his empire and controlled it. Now, this kind of divulged into different cities controlling different areas. This is the time of the Greek city-states, you may remember from world history. And one of those city-states, city states, Rome, became very strong. They were a very military-oriented society, uh, known for their strength. And they uh, dominated the other Greek city-states and established themselves as the world empire. And that happened shortly before the time of Christ. So from about 63 BC onward, we see the Roman Empire formed. Uh, in 63 BC, Augustus becomes the first ruler of the Roman Empire, which is worldwide at this point. And that lasts in varying degrees until, some would say, 1300 or so, when the Holy Roman Empire crumbles. And this, this Roman rule, it's quite a, quite a study in politics to go through it all, um, but it slowly began losing its power and crumbling and becoming more and more divided. First into eastern and western Rome, and then into several provinces, and then um, many of its regions declared their own independence, and uh, Europe became what it is today. Not a united power, not a world empire, but several divided countries. Which is exactly what we expected, right? Because the legs end with the feet part of iron and part of clay. And the interpretation was that it would be a divided kingdom after Rome. Sure enough, prophecy masses up. This is kind of our practice run, or our primer, in how Bible prophecy can be interpreted, and how we can see it played out in history. So, Daniel 7. This is a vision that Daniel himself had. We're only five chapters further in the same book. Daniel records it for us. He says, Daniel spake and said, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of the heaven stole upon the great sea. And four great beasts came up from the sea, diverse one from another. We won't go into this vision in a whole lot of detail, just in the interest of time. But these four beasts, once again, equated to the four empires. The first beast was a lion with wings on it. And as he watched, the, lions were plucked, the wings were plucked off the lion. It was given a heart, heart of a man, and made to stand on its two hind feet like a man. This represented Babylon, who in the first part of its uh, world empireship was controlled mostly by the Assyrians, who were uh, very ruthless people, very destroying people, and uh, very fast, and a very agile army, and that's why it was represented with the wings. Babylon became much more about governing their people rather than conquering new territory, and uh, Nebuchadnezzar finally comes to an understanding of who the true God is. That's what's recognized or symbolized by the heart of a man being given to the lion and made to stand upright. The next kingdom, if you'll remember, was Persia. The next beast that was shown to Daniel was a bear that had one shoulder higher than the other, 
three ribs in its teeth. They conquered it. So this uh, Persian Empire is represented by the lion. Its two shoulders, one higher than the other, represent well Darius and Cyrus, the first two rulers, uh, Cyrus being the one that rose to the greatest prominence historically. The next beast was a leopard with four heads and four wings. Remember the Grecian Empire was divided four ways, or into four wings, after Alexander the Great's death, and it was controlled by four heads, his four generals. Again, answers very directly with this beast. The last beast was a great and terrible beast. doesn't describe what animal it was, uh, it was, but it had ten horns, it had uh, metal teeth and nails, and it stamped and devoured and break in pieces. And it says three of the horns were knocked off by a smaller stout horn that grew up and it had eyes and a mouth speaking great things. Now, the interpretation that we're given in verse 17 is these four great beasts are four kings who shall arise out of the earth. So again, we can equate them with the four pieces of metal in the image. And the last we see there is Rome. And we can see the divisions of Rome in the ten horns. And three of those governmental divisions were taken over when Catholic Rome came into play. And Catholic Rome actually eventually dominated all of the Roman Empire and all of Europe until it crumbled with, basically, it lasted until Napoleon's conquests, the French Revolution, when it finally crumbled and was um, held to be confined in the Vatican City. Still a presence in, in Europe today, most certainly the worldwide. So, taking what we found from Daniel, how he interpreted this prophecies and how he saw them play out in literal world events. We'll move on from there to Ezekiel chapter 38 39, which contains a prophecy against God. So this program that I'm just opening here is known as ESORD. Um, I'll tell you a few things about it as we go here. So ESORD, the first thing is ESORD is a completely free Bible software. And it has a lot of helps resources in it. Very powerful program, and it can be downloaded free from esword.net. And I'll show that uh, hyperlink or the website, sorry, at the end of this presentation if you'd like to take that down. Incredible resource. We have our Bible here. We have several different translations of it that we can go look at. Um, easy to access any part of the scriptures. It's searchable. You can search for a word or a phrase in scripture. We can even compare different translations of the same verse. And then I also have my study notes here, which will be going through. Uh, as we go through the chapter, you can also look at dictionaries, including Bible encyclopedias, Strong's Concordance, Thayer's, etc. There's a lot of resources there. And uh, we also have marginal notes from most Bibles, uh, easily accessible. So we're going to look at Ezekiel 38. Uh, read from the Revised Version. It says, And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, set thy face toward God, of the land of Magog, the prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal, and prophesy against him. So let's stop here. First thing I think we need to establish is the time frame for this prophecy. We saw Daniel prophecy went from his time all the way to the time of the return of Christ, the span of 2,500 years or so. So where does this fall? Well, the first thing I'd like to do is look at Ezekiel 39, verses 8 through 12. It kind of gives us an idea of whether or not it's been fulfilled. So if we flip over to the next chapter, and this is still the same vision, as you'll notice as you go through it, look at verse 8. Can you just read that in the back, all right? Is that better? Okay. So it says in verse 8, Behold, it cometh, and it shall be done. Remember the phrase from Armageddon in Revelation 16? It is done. Behold, it cometh, and it shall be done, saith the Lord God. This is the day whereof I have spoken. It is the great day of God Almighty. Again, Armageddon. And they that dwell in the cities of Israel shall go forth and shall make fires of the weapons and burn them, both the shields and the bucklers, the bows and the arrows, the handstays and the spears, and they shall make fires of them seven years, which are the remnants of a great battle, so that they shall take no wood out of the field, neither cut down any out of the forest. For they shall make fires of the weapons, and they shall spoil those that spoiled them, and rob those that robbed them, saith the Lord God. And it shall come to pass in that day that I will give unto God a place for burial in Israel, the valley of them that pass through on the east of the sea, and it shall stop them that pass through. And there shall they bury Gog and all his multitude, 
And they shall call it the valley of Hamon Gog. We can look back through history and see if this has ever been, uh, been the case in Israel. And it hasn't. There's no place known as Hamon Gog because there's never been a Gogian host buried there. There's never been a war where the remnants of the war were fuel for seven years. Oops, sorry. And there's never been a war in which it took seven months to bury all the dead. So we're looking for something future. And again, as we saw in verse 8, this is the language that we saw in association with Armageddon. It shall be done. This is the day whereof I have spoken. So let's return to chapter 38 and see what events lead up to this day of Armageddon. In verse 2 we read, And a man set thy face toward Gog, of the land of Magog, the prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal, and prophesied against him. So we have a lot of ancient Hebrew names that we need to make sense of. A few notes on this. Gog is supposed to be of the land of Magog. Now we we can see from Hebrew scriptures, Genesis, that Magog and Gomer were the names of two sons of Japheth. Now remember after the flood, Noah and his three sons were left. Japheth was one of those sons. He tells us later in Genesis that two of his sons were known as Magog and Gomer. Okay? He tells us that, or Josephus tells us that Japheth, the sons of Noah, had seven sons, who proceeding from their primitive seats in the mountains of Taurus and Aminus, ascended Asia to the river Don, Tanais, and there, entering Europe, penetrated as far westward as the Straits of Gibraltar. A little further in this source, we find Magog founded the Magoge, whom the Greeks then called Scythe. So we can figure out what province the ancient Greeks called Scythe. We can find what the land of Magog was. Even a little further down in the same source, Herodotus, the most ancient Greek writer accessible, tells us the name Scythe was a name given by the Greeks to an ancient and widely extended people of Europe who had spread themselves from the river Tanae or Don westward along the banks of the Istra or Danube. So again, European territory. And the quote ends, from which original stock the present race of people in Europe seem to be descended. So Magog was the original uh, settler of Europe. It was his descendants that uh, lived in the area of, of Europe. I'll just show a map here. Here we have Israel, uh, Mount Ararat was probably in this region somewhere. They moved north into Asia, and it says from thence they traveled westward as far as the Straits of Gibraltar, which is all the way into Spain, Portugal area, and they uh, occupied all the region that they covered. So this Magog refers to all of Europe. Predominantly, it refers to the Germany Hungary area, which we can see from later on, crosses about um, Gomer. But at any, any rate, land of Magog is Europe. So this Gog is of the land of Magog. He's the prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal. Now, if you're reading along in a King James Version, you might find that the King James Version says, Set thy face against Gog, the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal. It doesn't mention Ross. You can look in your marginal notes if you'd like. It will tell you Gog, the phrase beginning Gog, can also be translated Gog, the prince of the land of Magog, the prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal. So, the way we should read this is that Gog is the ruler of the land of Magog. He's also the prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal. That's because Ross is a proper name rather than a common translator. So what can we find about these territories named Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal? We know that God is prince of, prince of Europe. He's also the chief of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal. Let's switch back to the revised version. What we find when we look at ancient ge- geographical texts, Ross is the most ancient form in which history makes mention of the name of Russia. Easy to see the connection. Ross, Russia. Uh, ancient historians, including Bokard in 1640, made the contention that Ross and Moscow properly denote the nations of Russia and Moscovy. Now those are both comprehended in Russia. Uh, we read on the modern names of Russia and of Moscow, or Moskwa, in ancient 
in the ancient names of Rosk and Mosk. Sorry, we discern the names of Russia and Moscow from Ross and Mosk. So these are the namesakes thereof. There's a third one there, Tubal. Well, the river Tobol is also in Russian territory now, and it gave its name to the city of Tobolba or Tobolsky. Tobolsky is a city region, um, which is the metropolis of the extensive region of Siberia. So again, we have Tobolsky uh, representing Siberia, which is also now in Russian territory. So we actually do have today one ruler of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal. They've all been united under the territory of Russia. So we read this as son of man, set thy face toward this Gog, who is the prince of Europe, prince of Russia, and prophesy against him, and say, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against thee, O Gog, prince of Russia. And I will turn thee about and put hooks in thy jaws, or other translations have a bridle in your mouth. And I will bring thee forth and all thine army, horses and horsemen, all of them clothed in full armor, a great company with buckler and shield, all of them having swords, Persia, Cush, and Put with, all, with them, all of them with shield and helmet. So here we have a few other uh, countries mentioned. Gomer and all his hordes, house of Tagarma and the uttermost parts of the north, and all his hordes, even many peoples with thee. So this ruler of much of Europe and Russia has a confederation of nations that are allied with him. And this great ally is mostly in the parts of the north. We'll see that again later on. You may remember that Gomer was the other son of Japheth that we read right about there with Magog and uh, represents parts of Europe as well, especially uh, the Germany area, Germanic peoples. Persia is current day Iran, although Persia comprehended a larger area than does present day Iran. Kush is Ethiopia, uh, etc. So if we want to read these verses with the information we found, we would read them as Son of Man, set thy face against Gog. The ruler of Russia, Hungary, etc., the ruler of Russia, and prophesy against him and say, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against thee, God, ruler of Russia, and I will turn you about and put a bit in your jaws, and will bring you forth from the north parts and all thine army, horses and horsemen, all of them are uh, countered or equipped with all sorts of armor, in a great company with bucklers and shields, all of them handling swords, among whom shall be Persians, Ethiopians, and Libyans, that is northern Africa, all of them with shield and helmet. French and Italian, so again, European powers, etc., and Tartar hordes of Uzbek, etc., and many people not particularly named besides. You have a large alliance led by this Russian force. Be thou prepared, prepare thyself, thou and all thy company that are assembled unto thee, and be thou imperial chief to them. So we should see Russia taking the preeminence in European affairs and a large uh, confederation with her doing something. What is that something? I'm going to read down in verse 8, continuing on. After many days thou shalt be visited. In the latter years thou shalt come into the land that is brought back from the sword, that is gathered out of many peoples upon the mountains of Israel, which have been a continual waste. But it is brought forth out of the peoples, and they shall dwell securely, all of them. So, if I was giving this lecture a hundred years ago, I would have to say, we should expect Israel to become a nation again, to be gathered out of all the nations that they are a part of, and uh, be established again on the mountains of Israel, that is, in the ancient homeland of the Jews. Since we're giving this lecture in 2012, we can say, in 1948, this happened. Israel was scattered, the Jews were scattered through basically every country in the earth, and somehow a country was formed for them, uh, out of land that British had uh, mandate over, and Israel was gathered out of many peoples and brought back to the mountains of Israel to be their homeland. They're there. This part of the prophecy has been fulfilled, and we would expect this Gogian host to come down against the mountains of Israel, against to the regathered, against the regathered nation of the Jews. Reading on, and thou shalt ascend, thou shalt come like a storm, thou shalt be like a cloud to cover the land, thou and all thy hordes and many peoples with thee. Thus saith the Lord, it shall come to pass in that day that things shall come into thy mind, and thou shalt devise an evil device. That is, you'll think an evil thought. I have a bad idea. And thou shalt say, I will go up to the land of unwalled villages. I will go to them that are quiet, that dwell securely, all of them dwelling without walls and having neither bars nor gates, to take the spoil and to take the prey, 
Turn thine hand against the waste places that are now inhabited, that is, Israel, and against the people that are gathered out of the nations, that is, Israel, which have gotten cattle and goods and dwell in the middle of the earth. The middle of the earth is quite an apt description of the country of Israel. You'll notice Israel borders on Asia, Europe, and Africa, has ports on the Mediterranean, which gives them access to the whole Western world, and also a port on the Red Sea, which gives you access to the Indian Ocean, all of Asia, Australia, and the rest of Africa. Certainly have to describe as the middle of the world. Um, just a reference here from Ezekiel 11, so a few chapters back, verse 17. Therefore, say, Thus saith the Lord God, I will gather you from the peoples and assemble you out of the countries where you have been scattered, and I will give you the land of Israel. Speaking to the Jews. And so we've seen this part of it fulfilled, and we know that the land that's being referenced to in verse 12 is that of Israel. Or verse 11, sorry. I'm going down to verse 13. Sheba and Dedan and the merchants of Tarshish, with all the young lions thereof, shall say unto thee, Art thou come to take a spoil? For this northern host comes down against Israel, and there is a response by another power, not allied with the guardian host, but a different power. And they respond by questioning his motivation. So who is the Sheba and Dedan and the merchants of Tarshish? Well, we're fortunate that scriptures actually give us quite a bit of information on this territory. We can read in Ezekiel, uh, going back in the 11 chapters, chapter 27, Tarshish was, the mer- was thy merchant by reason of the multitude of all kinds of riches, with silver, iron, tin, and lead. They traded for thy wares. So Tarshish was a merchant power. Tarshish traded with silver, iron, tin, and lead. So we should be looking for a country that's rich in mineral deposits, especially metals, and also a merchant country. We read on in the same chapter, the men of Dedan. So uh, we have Tarshish. Now we're talking about Dedan. The men of Dedan were like traffickers. Many isles were the mark of thy hand. They brought thee in exchange horns of ivory and ebony. So a couple of other clues about who Dedan might be. They were traffickers or merchant men, seafaring merchants. They were isle people, island people. It says many isles were the mark of thy hand. And it says they brought horns of ivory and ebony. Okay. Dedan. We read also in the, in the same chapter, Ezekiel 27, Dedan was thy trafficker in precious clothes for riding. Think silk. Um, also, talks about Sheba in the same verse. The traffickers of Sheba and Ramah, they were thy traffickers. Again, Sheba is a merchant power. So the Sheba, Dedan, and the merchants of Tarshish should point to us a seafaring trafficking company, a merchant company, a trading, not company, but a country, a trading country. Um, also, what they, what they traded here was cheap spices, precious stones, and gold. So we should be looking for a country that has lots of spices and lots of gold. We also read about the queen of Sheba going to visit Solomon. She gave the king 120 talents of gold, again, a place known for its gold, and spices, very great store, and precious stones. There came no more such abundance of spices as these which the Queen of Sheba gave to King Solomon. This is a country that was unrivaled for its spices. Uh, we also read of what Solomon's navy brought back uh, on his navy of Tarshish. It says, uh, the king had to see a navy of Tarshish with the navy of Hiram. Once every three years came the navy of Tarshish, and they brought gold, silver, ivory, apes, and peacocks. So the land of Tarshish had apes and peacocks. And there's a few places that do, but uh, India is certainly the one that's coming to mind. We can confirm that with 1 Kings 22:48. The Hashemite made ships of Tarshish go to Ophir for gold, but they went not, for the ships were broken at Easy on Geber. Fill up our map again. Easy on Geber is here. Uh, the only place that ships could sail from there is through the Red Sea and into the Persian Gulf and Indian Ocean. If they sailed by coastline, they would come right into India, which answers to the apes, peacocks, and precious spices, precious materials. Now, it doesn't say Tarshish was the country that answers them. It says Sheba and Dedan and the merchants of Tarshish. 
So what is the merchant power that made the most gain of Tarshish? And that answers to Britain. Britain. Think East India Trade Company. Um, and when we read about all these spices and precious gold and precious silk and, and metals that could be found in India, uh, we are reminded of the efforts to sail uh, west to India around the earth, which is the reason we're all here in North America today. Um, it was certainly a land known for all these riches. Now, there's one thing, though, that we talked about at the beginning. Um, these merchants of Tarshish traded with silver, iron, tin, and lead. Uh, now, the, the most well-known country that fits this description is Great Britain, especially in the southern areas of Britain. There's huge tin deposits, uh, lead deposits, mineral deposits, uh, especially metal ores. And so again, that allies, uh, aligns us with the idea that the merchants of Tarshish was the British power. It doesn't say that they're alone, though. It says, with all the young lions thereof, which again is... Uh, consistent with our idea that Britain is the power. Because Britain has always been known as the old lion country. Uh, if you remember from historical texts, um, where Great Britain is challenging its allies to go into World War II, and says the old lion is sending out the cry for the young lion to come in and, and protect her, help her protect, fight the enemy. Okay, so these young lions include the Commonwealth countries, United States, Canada, etc. And they respond to this northern invasion by saying, have you come to take a spoil? Are you getting all these people together to come and take away all the riches of the Middle East? And the riches of the Middle East didn't mean very much before the 1900s, but now that they're the richest area in the world for oil deposits, which is the most valuable commodity in the world, there is certainly a spoil to be taken in the Middle East, especially in the mountains of Israel. Um, Okay, so he goes on to say that God knows when Israel is drawn securely and it comes out of the place out of the uttermost parts of the north. Thou and many peoples with thee all have been riding upon horses a great company and a mighty army. And thou shalt come up against my people Israel as a cloud to cover the land. It shall come to pass in the latter days. I will bring thee against my land that nations may know me when I shall be sanctified in thee, O Gog, before their eyes. Let's go back here for a second. It's coming out of the uttermost parts of the north. Does that confirm what we deduced about these countries? Um, let's just take a look. look at our map again. Uttermost parts of the north. From out north of Israel, obviously where, this, obviously where this prophecy was made. I'm not talking about Syria and Lebanon. The uttermost parts of the north. Go as far north as you can and you run into Russia. Russia and her host of European confederates come down like a cloud to cover the land. Just looking at a map of this confederacy, Europe and Russia coming down against Israel, the map paints the picture of a cloud coming down to cover the land of Israel. And that's exactly what uh, Ezekiel tells us. Thou shalt come from thy place out of the uttermost parts of the north, and shalt come up against my people Israel as a cloud to cover the land. This is what we should be looking for. A host from Europe and Russia to be making a confederation and coming against Israel. Um, I won't go through the rest of this chapter in detail, but he says that God's going to fight against this Gogian host. In verse 22, I will plead against him with pestilence and with blood. I will rain upon him and upon his hordes and upon the many peoples that are with him an overflowing shower and great hailstones, fire and brimstone. And I will magnify myself and sanctify myself. And I will make myself known in the eyes of many nations and they shall know that I am the Lord. So we should be looking for an incredible event to take place when Russia comes down against Israel, when this Gogian host comes down against Israel. Uh, this is when God will intervene with uh, natural disasters, overflowing showers, great hailstones, fire and brimstone. God will fight against this host. And then we move on to chapter 39, which again, we won't go into in detail. Just a quick summary here. And thou son of man, prophesy against Gog. Thus saith the Lord, I am against thee. Turn thee about, will lead thee on, and will cause thee to come up from the uttermost parts of the north, and bring thee upon the mountains of Israel, and will smite thy bow out of thy left hand, will cause thy arrows to fall out of thy right hand, and thou shalt fall upon the mountains of Israel, thou and all thy hordes, and the people that are with thee, and will give thee unto the ravenous birds of every sort, and to the beast of, and the, to the beast of the field, to be devoured. Okay, so the powers that typically 
protect Israel, the United States, Great Britain, her allies, cannot stop this northern host from coming and covering the land of Israel. Instead, they have to just say, have you come to take a spoil? And so Israel has to realize they are without hope. They're actually taken over by this Gaudian host until God comes and rescues them. This is the battle of Armageddon. When God comes and strikes the bow out of the hand, or the weapons out of the hand of God, causes his arrows or his munitions to fall out of his right hand, and makes him fall on the mountains of Israel, all of his army. And he goes on to say, I will send a fire on Magog, that is Europe, and on them that dwell securely in the isles, that is the trading nations, and they shall know that I am the Lord, yet to happen. Again, this is the same as the stone hitting the image on its feet, and the image being crushed, and the stone becoming a great mountain that fills the whole earth. This is that stone becoming a great mountain. This is Christ setting up God's uh, nation over the whole world. In my holy name will I make known in the midst of my people Israel, neither will I suffer my holy name to be profaned any more. The nation shall know that I am the Lord, the Holy One in Israel. Alright, so it's a pretty good look at, at this chapter 38 and 39. Uh, I hope we learn a few things from it. And we'll move on. Again, uttermost parts of the north, which we looked at. We'll move on to what's happening in world events today. Do we see a Russian alliance or a European alliance possibly moving down against Israel now? That's what we should be watching for. Is it in the news? Well, we uh, can easily, we've got the internet now, just do a Google search for Russia or Europe, and we find all kinds of articles. Here's one that I uh, just pulled up from the other day. This is published December 4th, so five days ago. Putin to visit Brussels as Eurasian Union leader. Putin to visit Russia, Brussels as Eurasian Union leader. Isn't that what we're looking for? A European-Russian alliance. There it is in the news. I didn't like this. Russian President Vladimir Putin is expected to attend the EU-Russia summit in Brussels later this month, but he will make sure his host welcome him as the representative of the Eurasian Union. Putin's pet geopolitical project, which bears similarities to the EU. Is there any chance they might come against Israel? This is another headline from Greece. A fascist party in full cry. Black shirts smashing migrants' homes. Swastikas on the streets. No, not Germany in the 30s, but Greece in 2012. So certainly there is rising hatred of the Jews and any other immigrants and arise again of what we saw, the feelings that we saw when Israel was uh, made the, the subject of uh, mass holocaust. Now, do we see Russia making a move against Israel? Well, in the recent conflict in Israel, between Israel and Gaza Strip, Hamas organization in Gaza Strip, uh, this was one of the uh, newscasts, this is from Devka File, that's an Israel news source. Russia warships in position opposite Israel. It's from November 23rd, so still less than two weeks old. Uh, fleet's naval task force, including the missile cruiser Moskva, the destroyer Smet Libby, a large landing ships, or the large landing ships Nova Cherkask and Saratov, the tugboat MV-304, and the large oil tanker Ivan Bugnov, have received an order to remain in a designated area in the eastern Mediterranean ready to evacuate Russian citizens from the Gaza Strip should the Palestinian-Israeli conflict worsen. I see a little bit of a contradiction here. You're sending in a missile cruiser, a destroyer, and a large oil tanker to evacuate, to evacuate citizens. Um, anyway, we'll read on. The statement was issued Friday, November 23rd, by a source in the Russian Navy's My Command. And we'll continue this article on the next slide. That the files military sources say the Russian statement is in effect a cover story for the Naval Task Force drill mission which is a standby for coming developments in relation to the Syrian conflict. So, in other words, uh, Israel's military has realized that they're there for military presence, not civilian evacuation. Um, next paragraph is quite telling as well. Should we see the Shiva, Didan, and Tarshish powers trying to support Israel, although lately? Uh, Moscow used the Use the pretext first offered by Washington last week for the stationing of three U.S. warships led by the USS Iwo Jima amphibious ready group 
opposite Israeli shores last week, that is, as a precautionary measure for the evacuation of U.S. citizens in a war emergency. So you have two superpowers, Russia on one side of Israel with their warships, uh, the United States on the other side of Israel with their warships, both saying, we're just here to protect our civilians that may be in the region. So, certainly there's something going on that's gathering these nations together. We'll see if it's for the great day of God Almighty. So there's one more thing that I'll talk about before we leave here. We're getting a little bit long on time, but bear with me. This is Christ's own words about the end times. Matthew 24 is the chapter if you'd like to reference. So Matthew chapter 24 we read, Jesus went out from the temple and was going on his way. His disciples came to him to show him the buildings of the temple. But he answered and said unto them, Don't you see all these things? I say to you, there shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. So God's, uh, Christ is talking about the temple in Jerusalem. This is during Christ's time. And as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples asked him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? Now notice, what they asked him was two questions. When will the temple be destroyed? And what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? Now they may not have realized those were two separate events. But when they ask the question, they ask two separate questions. We've seen the temple destroyed. It happened by the Romans in AD 70. We have not seen Christ coming in the end of the world. So Jesus answers them. And we can divide his answer into two parts. Verses 4 through 22 refer to the temple's destruction when there will not be one stone left on another. Verses 23 to 36 tell us of the coming of Christ and the close of the age. So without going through the prophecy on the temple's destruction, we'll move down to verse 23. And you'll notice there's a transition here. It says, Then, then, if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or here, believe it not, for there shall arise false Christs and false prophets that shall show great signs and wonders, so as to lead astray, if possible, even the elect. And our trash heap of wrong predictions about Christ's return certainly fall into this class, along with many other deceivers. Behold, I have told you beforehand. Therefore they shall say unto you, Behold, he is in the wilderness, go not forth. Behold, he is in the inner chambers, believe it not. For as the lightning cometh forth from the east, and is seen even unto the west, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. Now, if you'll remember some of the people that predicted Armageddon or Christ's return, after their prediction didn't come true, they said, Well, I think it was just a spiritual return of Christ, and maybe the whole world didn't see it. This verse precludes that. For as the lightning cometh forth from the east and is seen even unto the west, so shall the coming of the Son of Man. So shall be the coming of the Son of Man. So you should expect an open event. Um, he goes on to say, But immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun shall be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of heaven shall be shaken. Then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. So how does this fit in with Ezekiel 38's prophecy? Well, it says, The sun shall be darkened, the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of heaven shall be shaken. Who are the powers of heaven? Then we think God and the angels, right? Those are not powers that can be shaken. God and his angels are not shaken at the return of Christ. So what's it speaking of here? Well, obviously it's figurative. The sun being darkened and the moon not giving her light and the stars falling from heaven are all figurative of something that's going to happen. Now what did we see from Ezekiel 38? What did we see from Daniel 2? From Daniel 7? The saints of the Most High will possess the kingdom. That means there has to be an overturning of political powers now present. And that's what it's speaking of here. It's not talking about the literal heavens. It's talking about political heavens. Those that are the highest on earth, highest powers on earth, they'll lose their power. They'll be shaken. There'll be great political earthquakes, huge political changes. It says, and then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn. Talked about that in Ezekiel 38 as well. Remember, after Christ smites the bow out of the hand of the Gaudian host and delivers Israel, it says they realize who God is. 
they repent and turn to God. Not just Israel, but the rest of the earth. So here you have that. Christ paraphrases it. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Now if we want to go beyond that, we can continue on, and he shall send forth his angels with the great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. This is the work of Christ after his return. He stops there, and he tells us a parable about this time. He says, Now from the fig tree learn her parable. When her branch is now become tender and put it forth its leaves, ye know that summer is nigh. Even so ye also, when ye see all these things... Know that he is nigh, even at the doors. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass away till all these things be accomplished. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. But of that day and hour knoweth no one, not even the angels of the heaven, neither the Son, but the Father. But the Father only. Now this generation here that, we're, that he says, this generation shall not pass away till all these things be fulfilled. And they were still referring us to this parable of the fig tree. He tells us when you see the fig tree, her branch is tender, she puts forth her leaves, you know that summer's coming. So when you see these signs come to pass, know that Christ is near even at the doors. Um, just a couple of cross references. What might the fig tree tell us about? Uh, what might the fig tree be referring to in this parable? Well, we can find some cross-references here. Uh, this one's from Luke 13, verses 5 to 10. If you can figure here where we can see. No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. This is Christ speaking. And he told this parable. A man had a fig tree. He planted it in his vineyard, and he came seeking fruit on it, and found none. He said to the vine dresser, Look, for three years now I've come seeking fruit on this fig tree, and found none. Cut it down. Why should it use up the ground? And he answered him, Sir, let it alone this year also, until I dig around it and put on manure. Then if it should bear fruit next year, well and good. But if not, you can cut it down. Where did Jesus tell this parable? It says, Now he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. Obviously he was speaking to the Jews who had produced no fruit heretofore, and God was ready to destroy him, but Christ had asked for them to be Allow time more to repent, to bring forth fruits. So the fig tree in this parable represented Israel. It was shortly after this that we read uh, that Christ is going to the temple and he sees this fig tree. He's hoping he can find some food on it, but there's nothing but leaves for the season of figs wasn't come. And, God, and Christ curses it. Right after that, he enters the temple and drives out unfaithful Israelites who had turned the worship of God into idolatry, into love of money. Uh, he, he derived them, and then the next thing we hear, and as they passed by in the morning, they saw the fig tree withered away to its roots. So again, a parable in action. Christ cursing the fig tree because it had no fruit, in the midst of him cleansing the temple and throwing Israelites out of it. So again, we can see that this fig tree was Israel, who refused to bear fruits and was withered up to its roots. Now, withered away to its roots is exactly what Israel has been for the last 2,000 years. There's been no nation of Israel. There's still a root of them. They still have their heritage. They still have uh, their ancestry. But they're not a living nation. We read in Job 14, verse 7 through 9, though, about what can happen to a withered tree. It says, For there is hope for a tree if it be cut down, that it will sprout again, and that its shoots will not cease. Though its root grow old in the earth, and its stump die in the soil... Yet, at the scent of water, it will bud and put out branches like a young plant. That sounds quite like what we just heard from Christ's parable in Matthew 24. When her branch is now become tender and put it forth its leaves, you know that summer is nigh. So, what, it, what he seems to be telling us when he says this generation will not pass away till all be fulfilled... Here, the generation that sees Israel bud forth and blossom from its dry root will not disappear until Christ's return is accomplished. Now, I do have to uh, 
do have to give you an additional note on this verse. If we look at the original text for generation, we find that this word actually has two meanings in the Greek. Unfortunately, the original word was genea. It's from a presumed derivative of, of a word genos. It means a generation, but by implication it means an age. It's the periods or the persons. It can be uh, translated age, generation, nation, or time. So when we look at this passage, it either indicates that the generation of people who witness Israel's rebirth will not pass away until its return, or it may be interpreted as the age we are now in will not pass until after all these prophecies come to reality. One is based on the literal meaning of the word, and one is based on the implications that the word sometimes carried. Now if we turn to Revelation, which we don't have time to do today, but if we, if we were to take a very detailed look at the prophecies of Revelation, it would certainly indicate that the return of Christ must very closely follow the events surrounding Israel's rebirth. And we saw that theme echoed in, in the, um, the tone of Ezekiel 38 and 39. So I'll leave that for you to consider and, and discuss in your own time. We'll finish up here with public reactions to the 2012 myths. I just want to contrast the reaction to the myths about Mayan legend and lore to the reaction that the scriptural prophecies should bring in us. So this is from Wikipedia. Uh, Wikipedia is known to be a, a very reliable source. Uh, it is good to check the sources on this, but I, I think on this article it's, it's quite reliable. Uh, under 2012 phenomenon, public reactions... A paragraph. The phenomenon has spread widely since coming to the public notice, particularly on the internet. Ask an astrobiologist, a NASA public outreach website, has received over 5,000 questions from the public on the subject of the mind calendar since 2007. Some asking whether they should kill themselves, their children, or their pets. In May 2012, an Ipsos poll of 16,000 adults in 21 countries found that 8% had experienced fear or anxiety over the possibility of the world ending in December 2012 while an average of 10% agreed with the statement, the Mayan calendar, which some say ends in 2012, marks the end of the world. 10%, one out of 10 people. With responses as high as 20% in China, 12% in the United States, where sales of private underground blast shelters have increased noticeably since 2009. At least one suicide has been directly linked to fear of a 2012 apocalypse, with several more anecdotally reported. Uh, you can also read about uh, the response of several Latin American countries, um, mass suicide attempt based on this 2012 phenomenon. So you see fear, you see panic, you see uh, loss of rationality as a response to this suspicion of the Mayan calendar. In contrast to that, what is the response we should have to scriptural prophecy? It's not craziness, it's not lack of rationale, it's watching. Galatians 16.15, the Armageddon chapter. Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watches and keeps his garments, lest he walk naked and may see his shame. Watching and keeping our garments. And with that in mind, I want to introduce to you a website called keytobibletruth.com. This contains the key lessons, so if you go to Key to Bible Truth, this is the website you'll see. It's a little skewed on my screen, not so bad up there. Um, at any rate, this is uh, the key lessons introduction. You can click here to begin. If you want to see a lesson on a particular topic, you can hit the lesson index button. Um, there's several lessons there. Uh, one that's particularly relevant at this point is key 12, Bible teaching about responsibility and judgment. If you hit that, you have a PDF version of this lesson plan. You can print it. You can save it as a PDF on your computer. Uh, the last page has a, a couple of questions. Uh, that you, or a few questions that you can go through just kind of review your understanding of, of the lesson. Excellent set of lessons. There's 30 lessons. We're actually having uh, Thursday evenings. We have a group study going through these le uh, lessons in Saskatoon. We can certainly start one in North Battleford area or Richard if there's enough uh, interest. <clears throat> so that's the Key to Bible Truth website. I also encourage you once again Use eSword, download it, it's a free download. If you've got a laptop, if you've got a computer with an internet connection, you can put it on there. 
And eSword is an incredibly powerful tool because it allows you to do the research yourself. You don't have to rely on someone else to tell you what the Bible says. You can do the research yourself. You don't have to think of times like this as an island of resources. It's not. You can access this stuff anytime when you learn how to use your resources. eSword is one of the, one of the most uh, condensed, uh, most resource-dense uh, programs you can find. And lastly, I want to uh, turn you on to the Richard Bereans website. Dave introduced that we're both part of the Berean Christadelphians, which is a Bible study support group organization. And our website is there. This address will be given again in Saskatoon, if the Lord is willing, on December 21st, or sorry, December 20th. It's a Thursday, 7.30 p.m. And uh, we'll try to get uh, some information on that on the website there. And I'll leave you with Matthew 24. Really, I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. These prophecies are real, and they will not be, they will not fall flat to God's words. So, thank you all for coming, and I hope you found the presentation informative, and uh, wish you well on your future studies of the scriptures.